In many ways, Sor Juana's Loa to the mystery play, Divine Narcissus, is a very conventional allegoric allegory for theater of the time, but in, uh, in certain respects it's trying to do something quite unique in the way that it's looking to bridge divides in the world that Sor Juana sees. Uh, divides between divinity and nature, between Europe and America, between Catholic and the native population uh, religions that they find there, between Catholic and the Protestants who are uh, making some progress in throughout Europe at the time, uh, between the, uh, the medieval traditions that, uh, that she is drawing from and the Enlightenment uh, revolution that is burgeoning. And also, of course, because it is Sor Juana, very close under the skin of this is a uh, meditation on the divisions between male and female and the rights afforded to one, but less so the other. And it's a, uh, a remarkable little piece in that in a, in a very short, tight span of time, working within a very conventional allegorical uh, uh, genre, you get a extraordinarily specific, personal uh, vision, artistic vision. And it, in many ways, it argues many of the, uh, the, the, the fundamental uh, debates of the time for that for that time and place from Mexico of the uh, um, uh, the, the, the 16th century uh, it begins with uh, the, it is just a dialogue really there's some action going on a surprising amount actually uh, given the uh, given the genre but it's really just a dialogue between four primary players between the Occident the America, between zeal and religion, uh, and then music is another character sort of operating as a Greek chorus uh, in the background, and then there are some extras, some soldiers, you know, the people who can run around and be scary uh, and give an idea of commotion. Um, but Occident, meaning West, is, uh, is the male representation of the New World, and America is the female representation of the New World, and they are the native population. They are the uh, it, it is the they are the representatives of the culture, clinging on to their particular uh, religious beliefs, their native religious beliefs uh, of uh, what essentially the Aztec beliefs, the uh, ancient Mexican uh, natives, and they are met by these new, uh, the new kids in town, uh, the character of Zeal, who is the male representation of, uh, uh, of Europe, and the, uh, the, uh, the conquistadors, I suppose you would have to call them, uh, and also religion, which is the female representation. And that's where things start to get a little bit curious and fun. It begins with music. And here you can see uh, the, the presence of music used. Uh, it's, of course, it goes back throughout uh, the history of drama. But here you can see a particular role for music that is being played out as, uh, a, 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 as a uniter, as a joiner of these disparate forces. And this, you always have to remember in the back of your mind, Sor Juana was actually quite the fan of music. She studied it quite formally, music theory and, and composition, and, uh, and she wrote a lot about music. She was a very big fan. Uh, it's a very emotional, very spiritual art form. It's something that she would have had access to some, uh, some of in, uh, through the church, but it was, and certainly through her, her life as a courtier before she became a nun. Uh, but you can see she has a very uh, sentimental almost role carved out for music. But music comes in, the character of music comes in with a, a speech, Mexicans most noble, 
right away, off the top of your head. Always look at beginnings and endings. Here, that identifies the native Mexican population as most noble, which to a Spanish audience, a European audience, is going to be, hmm, that's okay. It's a little bit strange. Uh, these are not the savages, necessarily, that uh, Europeans generally considered the, uh, the native populations of, of the Americas. Uh, Mexicans most noble, whose ancient lineage has its genesis in the bright rays of the sun. This is the blessed day, the day of the year, when we all pay homage to our highest deity. Our highest deity. Uh, which implies one among many. Uh, highest means that there are others to be above. Uh, so right there you have a the pagan background of, uh, of, of the Aztec culture. But it's also a, a singling out of one above the others. A, uh, this, this is a belief in, uh, it, it's called monolatry. It's the belief in one God supreme over other gods. Uh, this tradition goes back quite a ways. The Greeks did it with Zeus, was essentially king of the gods. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the, the Old Testament. You know, when, when God commands, you shall have no other god but me, it kind of implies that there are other gods out there, but God's telling you that, you know, well, no, you, you just got to listen to me. Uh, and that's what this is. So it's a, it's a culture that is being singled out for a kind of monotheism there, uh, which may or may not be accurate, uh, as uh, historians and sociologists will tell you, but it's it's trying to bridge a divide between the Catholic um, Spanish and the pagan, if you will, uh, Mexicans. So they're trying to find that common ground, and here is one where Sor Juana is zeroing in on and saying, look, they have a God who is above all else, and well, sort of, we do too. It's just that we single him out a little bit more and poo-poo the idea that he had any, uh, you know, any contemporaries. Although the Catholic faith, of course, especially in the world, uh, in the eyes of the Protestants coming up in Europe, uh, had a, an awful lot to do with the, um, the semi-pagan background of the Catholic Church. The belief in saints and angels and all this. Protestants shoot all of that down. The Protestant Reformation rejects that vehemently. But this is where the Catholicism is trying to carve out a specific identity for itself. Uh, and they identify the Mexicans, uh, particular god, is the god of seeds. Um, it's a uh, it's a fertility god of uh, of sorts, a god of the harvest. Um, and then, okay, so the music has a little entry, and then you get the entrance of the native uh, the native uh, titular figures, the Occident, the America. Um, you get a sense of immediately they are introduced with what makes them so um, foreign, so alien, uh, that needs to be co-opted. So the Occident begins immediately talking about, uh, for among uh, all the most high gods, stressing that plural right there, solemnly adored in my rites, religious uh, practices, uh, so many deities, hitting that polytheism thing again, uh, and then talking about sacrificing hot human blood. So we're, we're into like the, uh, the explicit distinctions in religious worship practice. And this is going to land on the European audience. It's like, oh wow, these people are these people are foreign. These people are barbaric. These people are, you know, practically Satanists. Um, but he again sort of clues in on that uh, semi uh, semi special role for uh, for the God of Seeds. Uh, say this again, my greatest devotion is fixed upon him, the highest of all the gods, of all the high gods. So cluing in on that monolatry um, context. And America 
goes even further with that. And, and, with, and with reason for this great God alone, this great God alone, narrowing the scope even further. It's like, yes, okay, we're pagans, we believe in a lot of gods, but this God alone, Sorvana is zeroing in on that concept, the idea that they're not so different after all. This is right in the beginning of the play. This is what she is uh, spending some time with. Um, and they identify uh, some of the other aspects of the culture. They, they hint on, uh, you know, the, the gold that is found in the Americas and how it makes it very wealthy and how it is very rich and links that gold to the kind, uh, to the, um, uh, to, to the notion of it, since the gold is in the land, it is sort of like uh, it is sort of like crops. It is seeded by perhaps the god of seeds because that's who plants everything in the ground that comes up of value and then ties that into um, then to this divine protection provides more than corporeal food for us to eat, more than corporeal food for us to eat, which is communion, which is the wafer, the cracker, the bread that becomes the body of Christ and is a food for the soul, so to speak. So again, Sor Juana is zeroing in on these little uh, commonalities between the pagan background and the Catholic interlopers of sorts. Uh, but then the Europeans arrive. Religion and zeal march on the uh, stage and it is, uh, well, it doesn't go all that well. Zeal is especially zealous to start, uh, start a conflict. America, the female, is trying to find some bridges, trying to negotiate, trying to be uh, diplomatic, if you will, reaching out, showing some concern. Um, but it's also significant, I would say, that she seems to be the one in charge. Uh, when she says, I am the Christian religion and I shall endeavor to turn your provinces to my worship, um, she doesn't mention zeal. Zeal just seems to be the tool, uh, the, uh, you know, the mechanism through which she will do this if need be. But she seems to be the driving force here. So Sor Juana has put the ladies in charge, so to speak. Um, they are... Uh, the powerful ones. Zeal sort of feels that little rub and you can see uh, around line like uh, 157 or so how most barbarous oxygen and how most blind idolatry can you disdain sweet religion my dearly loved and gentle wife automatically identifying himself with her and trying to claim some of her power, it would seem, uh, making it seem like she is an appendage of him as opposed to the other way around, which is kind of how she was couching it. Um, you get uh, this sense of burgeoning conflict between them, Occident, uh, uh, you know, after Zeal goes off on a little speech, which is a little bit you know, uh, undiplomatic um, and threatening, forced, you know, threatening war, uh, violence, if nothing else. Uh, Occident can believe that, you know, they're, they're going there, they're sounding that note. So he says, what God, what error, what offense, what punishment do you proclaim? I do not understand your words and have no idea of your meaning. So right there, you're getting a sense of, because well, whenever a writer mentions words, uh, it, it's a problem of interpretation that the idea of how to understand one another is key um, to the problem that there that's being addressed. And here, remember back to the requesta, um, Sorvana's argument that well, the ability to think comes from education, and that if you want to be a good uh, ambassador for God, if you want to be a good servant of God, you need to be able to think, you need to be able to express yourself, you need to be able to logically make your case. Um, and so that's why she was 
saying in that that you know uh, women need to be educated too uh, and it it works out for everybody if they are here that same argument is finding a little bit of traction um, but music jumps in after that as of course oxygen and zeal start a little back and forth and you can see they're kind of the most hostile ones the most aggressive ones uh, guys uh, music always seeking to uh, bring people together to unite them to uh, to bind opposites uh, of sorts uh, music comes in just chipes in out of chimes in out of nowhere and in festive pageantry come worship and revere the great god of seeds here explicitly taking the uh, taking the side it would say of the uh, the natives um, um, America presses for calm you know uh, barbarian madmen blindly with words none understand you wish to perturb the serenity that we enjoy in tranquil calm and peace cease in your efforts or you will be reduced to ash and not even the winds will bear news that you once lived a couple of things there uh, she is uh, she's prioritizing for one thing calm and here I can see like a little theme of the enlightenment coming in that they like to be reserved and calm they don't like agitation necessarily enlightenment likes things to be calm and reasonable uh, so you know when things get tense and emotional uh, that is not a enlightenment atmosphere but also she is referencing nature she uh, she talks about the winds um, uh, not even the winds will bear you news that uh, will, be, will bear news that you once lived so there is a certain connection there that will be further developed of America being tied to nature and as as that takes hold you also get um, a conflicting position generally voiced by zeal threatening uh, violence in the form of lightning and thunderbolts which is, is speaking the language of nature but what they mean is uh, guns the Europeans have guns and the natives at the time did not so they didn't know what they were but they made a lot of noise it sounded like thunder and they're playing with that natural world mechanical world and that conflict between them um, everything heats up uh, there is a uh, the conflict uh, builds they uh, they go to war they uh, they scream they um, uh, there is there is violence there is noise it's a great scene of people running around that's where the soldiers come in and when it is over they need to um, make peace essentially America and the Occident have been defeated but now they need to find some common ground um, it's a military victory without a uh, at this point without a, a, a diplomatic victory so it's really no victory at all just yet they um, let me think where to go um, mm, religion lays out her argument it's a uh, as the um, as the occidents are still uh, as the occident and America are still hesitant they uh, they stress um, the value of their way of life um, occident says you know uh, well religion asks religions always trying to build a little bit of a common ground here and religion is generally more inquisitive always asking questions more than laying down threats uh, religion is generally seen as sort of a stand-in for Sor Juana herself as if she was writing herself a little role in this uh, she asked you know which God is the one you revere let's talk um, and oxygen jumps in he is the God who makes fertile the fields that produce our harvests 
before the heavens bow down and whom even the rains obey. So he is the God who provides food and water. Um, simple human concerns. Uh, the same God who washes away our sins, no matter how vile, then becomes the food he offers us, which is a frank uh, Christianization of uh, the, the native practices. It becomes the food he offers us. That's communion, again, the bread of the body of Christ. Uh, but also, you know, the, the concern with grace and forgiveness. God washes away our sins. God cleanses us. Uh, God is a loving and embracing God in that way. And, but specifically also, look out, look what's, what's the first thing out of their mouth is the food and the water. So those human concerns take priority, literally in this speech, before the sins. So the human concerns come first before the, um, the more abstract uh, divine concerns, which is significant. Um, and religion does a little aside as if, you know, here she shows a little bit of an edge and a aside speaking directly to the audience, perhaps, uh, can be a little snarky. Um, and she scoffs at this concern with love and solace. Um, Lord, save me. What crafty designs and devices, what mimicries do these falsehoods intend toward our holiest, our most sacred truths? You know, we don't care, care so much about food and water. Um, oh, wiliest of serpents, most venomous of straits, oh, hydra spewing out of your seven mouths of the, all, the de uh, all the deadly hemlock. Uh, hydra, um, serpents, snakes. This is obviously a, uh, a fixation on sin and, you know, the serpent going back to Adam and Eve. But you can see that, you know, the, no, we're, we're Christians, so we're primarily concerned with sin and evil and the dark aspects of this. And he doesn't mention food or water or anything like that or anything particularly human. Uh, but she lays out her clear goal, uh, but with your own lies and deceit, if God grants this skill to my tongue, I shall most surely convince you, which is conversion. And this is what she is here to do. Zeal is uh, the male conquistador there to conquer the natives and basically take the gold and make off with it. Um, but that dual project, um, you can't forget the role of religion here because the other goal of Spain in this era was conversion and rounding up more Catholics for, you know, team Pope. And that was a big part of it. So here you see her, her real agenda has less to do with the gold and much more to do with just getting those souls on the Catholic side. Uh, so she's willing to engage in some um, uh, diplomacy here and honestly a sales pitch. Uh, I must reason with the doctrine of Paul, she says, religion says, for when he preached to the people of Athens, he knew of their law that mandated death for the, any seeking to introduce new gods to the city. He was aware as well of the altar dedicated to an unknown God and declared these words to, to them. This is not a new do deity. No, this God, I tell you, is the unknown God you worship and adore here at this altar. So here again, she's making this explicit appeal saying we are not that different. You have your one God above all, that God is our God. And we, we can find common ground on that. And she is making this appeal. But significantly, she is making this appeal, I must reason. She is making an argument. She's making a logical argument, trying to build this place through reason to convince them, not just to convert them necessarily, but to convince them, to make it a uh, an argument to make it a logical argument 
for if the flowering meadow is fertile, if fields are fruitful and the fruit proliferates, and if the sown fields grow and bloom, and if the clouds distill the rain, all is the work of his right hand, neither the arm that cultivates, nor the rain that fecundates, nor the warmth that animates, none of these could make the plants flourish and grow without the presence of his productive providence that gives the plants their vegetative soul. This is nature. This is a god of nature. This is the god who is visible through nature. America admits, and shall my eyes not see this god so that I may be persuaded. America is a uh, the native who's now getting curious about the European Catholic god, and but she wants to see evidence. She wants to see evidence. Zeal and the Occident are still sort of, you know, grudgingly coming along. They're still kind of guys, but they're, they, they seem to have struck a bit of a, uh, a, a detente. And America and religion are um, almost of the same mind. And there's this wonderful little uh, alliance formed uh, verbally as the characters finish each other's sentences or uh, continue uh, each other's sentences, uh, where Zeal says, this being so, let us kneel before the royal feet where two worlds meet and most humbly beg for pardon. This is the male character uh, basically um, declaring obeisance to secular power. Um, he, is, he is the conquistador. Uh, religion comes there and puts in the note and their bright, illustrious queen sticking in that note that uh, the female power. America joins that and says, and those majestic sovereign feet the Indies do most humbly kiss, presumably of the queen, swearing allegiance on behalf of her nation, but also it would seem uh, there's a little bit of a gender um, there's a gendered notion to this, a gendered alliance that's forming. Um, and Zeal comes in, the male conquistador, again, finishes America's sentence and says, and her supreme noble councils, who are probably all men, uh, getting that in there, and religion tacks on after that. Her ladies who illuminate their hemisphere, one-upping once again, and then America and her wise men, whom my poor wisdom humbly prays to pardon and forgive its wish to summon a great mystery with these rough and clumsy verses. Um, the natives, America here, seem to be uh, less sexist, perhaps, than the Europeans. Is that to be admired? Is Sor Juana suggesting that, well, this is a good model. They have some great ideas. They're not as uh, uh, repressive of the women. They have uh, some value in society. And gee, maybe we can take that idea from them. Hmm. The uh, subtle criticism ain't so subtle. Um, significantly. That speech by America, which has its, uh, its rhetorical uh, echo also in the Requesta because of the, the, and the whole rhetorical tradition, the whole European rhetorical tradition of saying, oh, well, you know, uh, I'm so humble. Don't, don't take my, uh, you know, I, I, my, my words are very uncouth. I'm not up to the task of making this sound noble. Don't ever take that for, you know, that's all, that's always a line. Uh, but she gets that line. And then Occident comes in with the closing speech saying, let us begin for my longing age to see what God, what the God is like, who will be served to me as food. Um, it, which is almost a funny line, uh, kind of a travesty of, uh, of Christianity. 
but also it reiterates his concern with human concerns of, you know, eating. Um, but it shows that he has been sort of swayed and is now being brought into the faithful, the community of uh, Catholic worshipers. But America and the Occident get the last words of this play. After that, it's just the chorus where they all say, let us, oh, let us bless this day when we come to know the great true God of seeds, the true God of seeds, meaning uh, probably in this by, well, it could be taken either way, that on, on both sides, they are recognizing a divine value in the uh, religion of the other. And so that is kind of a neutral statement there. You can unpack it a bunch of different ways. But I think of significance is that the last speakers on this are the natives, not the Europeans. They had the first speeches in the beginning. They have the last spe speeches at the end. Who sets the tone? Who sets the, uh, the agenda for the, for, the, uh, for the play itself? First and last, beginnings and endings. Always, always, always look at that. And this tells you in very explicit form who Sor Juana thinks that we should be spending more time considering. Who should be allowed a voice? They, she makes the argument a couple of times in here that the uh, that the Americas are not just you know some backwater to be exploited, but there is value there, and that their opinions, their culture, should be respected. And in that, again, you can see that dynamic of Sor Juana, who always felt like she was being ignored, who was never granted the fullest opportunity to become uh, who she wanted to be demanding recognition and again and again and again on that individual personal level all the way up to a intercontinental level a spiritual level as well demanding recognition to say don't just ignore us we have something of value here in the americas and whether you know it or not you should pay attention to us